So we are tier one silver. We are a premier exploration company with a focus on silver and gold that are assets based in Peru. To give you a brief understanding, uh, first I'll go through the disclaimers. There will be some forward looking statements here. I promise everyone it'll be within good taste. So really to give you an understanding of, of how tier one came to be. We came from a group uh, who is led by Ivan Bebek, who I'm sure everyone is aware of at this point, and Sean Wallace. These are these are two gentlemen that are properly the two of the best leaders of companies you know you could ever have. Uh, it is rare for a geologist and rare for management to have uh, an immense great exit in the market. To do it multiple times, to do it good in good markets and bad markets is is truly extraordinary. And they have done that. Keegan Resources, uh, back in, in the early 2000s, providing an incredible return for investors. And then in one of the worst uh, bear markets in the public markets, uh, they did it again by selling Keegan Resources to Agnico for over $200 million. To give you an idea where Tier 1 uh, originated from, if you're unaware to this point, Oren Resources was our parent company. In October of 2020, they decided to split up their assets. Fury Gold Mines hosted all the Canadian assets and they spun out on their own and are currently publicly traded. Tier One Silver, the company we're talking about here today, hosted the precious metals portfolio in Peru and Sombrero Resources has an, an immense copper portfolio, which you're gonna hear a lot more about in, in the coming months. To give you an idea of, of the management team. So there's myself, I, I am the last piece of the puzzle last to join the team. I came from doing 10 years at Canaccord Genuity on the retail banking side. I have an immense experience in raising capital and uh, and dealing with the capital markets. But really the, the heart and soul and, and the true pedigree of our team lies within our technical team. Uh, David Smithson, Michael Hendrickson, both formerly of Newmont, uh, really are paving the way and, and uh, providing us with immense amount of, of confidence due to their experience and uh, and their past successes. So I mentioned Ivan and, and Sean Wallace previously and uh, and Dave and, and Michael on our technical team, but really our, our board of directors is unlike any other exploration team as well. Uh, especially when you look at a fellow like Antonio Rivas. This is the former chief geologist of Newmont and former VP of exploration of BHP. So we really have a well-rounded team when it comes to corporate finance, leadership, experience, people knowing how to make that discovery, how to handle that discovery. Our technical team, which considered to be operations is, is second to none. And, uh, and myself uh, rounding out the capital markets. It's, it's, it's one thing to lead a private company. It's an entirely different animal to run a public company. So we really do feel like we have all the bases covered. Again, a quick refresher of our technical team uh, between Michael and David. These are these are two all stars. Christian leading the roles down in Peru with operations. You can take a look at the bottom and see the pedigree and the companies that have been brought together working for an exploration team. We are an exploration team, but we're well financed. We're well led, and and probably more important than anything, we have the asset to pursue. You're going to get a feeling of of the the company and, and why we're in Peru. Well, why are we in Peru? Well, it's a vast mineral rich country that it remains for the most part unexplored. And uh, I know we keep hitting on this, but the portfolio project uh, that tier one is, is leading is to provide multiple opportunities for every one of our shareholders time and time again to have that world-class swing. We've talked about Rick Rule, what he considers to be a tier one company you know, every one of our projects provides investors with that opportunity. So the focus today will be Curabaya because we have our drill permits access. We have our first drill hole completed as, as of yesterday and as of last night. If, if you've been following our social media, we have started our second drill hole right over our target where we produced a 300,000 gram per ton silver rock sample and close to a kilo gold sample. So we are driving a drill right over that and we're, we're, we're really looking forward to what comes next. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to, to Dave so we can get into the, to the meat of Curabaya. Thanks, Peter. Um, what everybody's seeing here in the, the image is uh, a map of Southern Peru. And there's a, 
orange bar on the on the bottom there, and you can see Kiribati highlight, highlighted. In um, 2016, uh, to end of 2015, start of 2016, um, we recognised that this belt of prolific porphyries and epithermals in this part of Peru was something that we really wanted to pursue as a as a as a exploration concept. Um, this area has been looked for, looked over for many years. Um, there's some big giant deposits to the northwest of us uh, in the form of uh, Tocopala, Cajone and Teaveco. These are Paleocene age systems. They're giant. They're between uh, three and six billion ton uh, uh, metal giants. And then to the south into Chile, uh, they continue again and they make big deposits down there. And so this part of Peru has always been um, a really sought after uh, s section of the country where one of these giants could be, could be existing and nobody's been able to identify one. So we took the, on the challenge in 2015, 2016, and we conducted a two and a half thousand square kilometer geo geochemical screen. And, you know, instead of just rocks and hammers, we used a proprietary technique um, uh, using rivers to guide us towards areas of endowment. And we conducted that survey. It took us uh, quite a while to do. And, um, after we'd screened that ground, um, Kuribai popped up on the radar. And uh, Kuribai came in as the uh, number one copper, number one gold, and number two copper anomaly uh, in all of that ground from the border with Chile all the way up to um, those metal giants to the northwest. Just go to the next one, please, Peter. Um, so that anomaly was in a really interesting area because um, it's actually located in a really, really um, um, feasible part of Peru to do to do work and to do business and um, to find something that uh, has um, the infrastructure and the location that it could actually be uh, economic. So the the property itself is located um, about. Uh, it's right now, it's about an hour 45 from um, Tacna, which is a city of 300,000 people. It also has an international airport and it takes about uh, an hour 20 minutes on the plane from uh, Lima to, to get there. And then we're on the Pan American Highway for half of that distance and then there's a 45 minute drive into the project. So it's really accessible. It's also at low elevations which is a really big deal in Peru. Um, we're between uh, 2,000, uh, 1,000 and 3,000 meters, um, which is really, um, really quite low. Um, there's a hydroelectric station to our north. So there's possibility of uh, drawing power from a hydroelectric station to the north. That's only uh, about 12 kilometers from the, from the, uh, the claim boundary. And to our west is the Elo port, which is um, the exportation port for all of the, um, for those metal giants that we mentioned earlier. Um, so it's got infrastructure, uh, it's a great location, and um, there's lots of, um, um, there's, uh, there's really good infrastructure in the city of Tacna, which uh, services all those big mines as well. Um, and what that really means to us is that we don't, we're not at the end of the world trying to find something. We don't need to find a giant, super high grade system for it to be economic. We're in a good place, we're in a low elevation, we're in a place where we can actually, whatever we find could be economic. So our thresholds are very reasonable. So that blank survey took us to, into a really great spot for those reasons as well. This, is, this map shows that the other competitors, this is an updated map. Um, when we decided to do this screen in 2016, all the majors were getting out of the area and that's why we decided to go for it. Um, we knew that that concept was there for a Paleocene system. We knew that the giants were to the north and to the northwest and to the southeast of us. And we knew that it would be a pr very prospective um, piece of the crust. And for whatever reason, a lot of the majors were getting out at that point. So we, we were able to screen it and get the best ground. Um, since then, since, as, I was, as I was mentioning earlier, people have been looking for these Paleocene giants. And um, you can see that by the by the, um, the claim position here. Um, Southern's in there, Vale's in there, Rio Tinto's in there, BHP's in there. So we're not the only ones to recognize that this is a really prospective part of Peru to be, to be um, looking for mineral deposits. And in fact, um, you can see that Peter's just um, 
highlighting it, the, the Tokopala pit's just there. And that's just, um, I think it's 40, 42 kilometers um, from, from the, uh, the land uh, position that we hold. So we're in a really, really good spot. So when we um, identified um, Kuribai as being really interesting on our stream set, uh, of course, we need to follow up. And in 2016, we started doing that. So we generated this project on, on our own proprietary technique. And um, we went onto the ground and started looking at what, trying to explain the source of that anomaly. And when we went in there, we started seeing veins. We started seeing epithermal veins um, that were varying in, in width from centimeters to tens of centimeters up to a meter. And so we knew that that that, uh, that was a really good indication of that there was system present. And we started sampling them. And to our surprise, they were super bonanza grade. Um, and here's a list of, um, this is some work we've done since then. And it's the list of um, kind of the top 20, 20, top 20 grabs. And we've seen, uh, we've confirmed the, that there's bonanza there. And the bonanza can be quite exceptional, up to 300 kilograms of silver with almost a kilogram of gold, which is highly unusual. And um, when we started setting to looking around what was there, we realized that there was a large footprint of these veins. And so now we fast forward, we, uh, we acquired the ground, it's 100% ours. Um, it doesn't have an NSR over it. Um, and we're under no spend obligations to anybody. Uh, so whatever we find is ours. So in 20, uh, during COVID actually, in the beginning of 2020, um, we started the first systematic look at the, at the system. And um, our first question was, okay, we've identified uh, some veins on surface. It's in a really good place. It's very amenable to finding something. It's got infrastructure nearby. What's the footprint? Is it big or is it small or what is this thing? So we set to selectively sampling and trying to find more veins. And the more we looked, the more we found. And the map that you see in front of you here is, um, is a compilation of all of the rock chips at uh, greater than 200 ppm silver, which is considered, you know, uh, around, uh, around a lot of these like high grade equivalents to our north. And um, what we highlighted initially was um, a footprint of about 1.4 by 1.8 kilometers of, um, of uh, silver, silver veins of, of the epithermal variety. So um, that sits within a, a larger footprint of alteration. You can see the kind of green to hotter, hotter colors in the oranges and reds. Um, they are clays. These are, this is truly an epithermal system um, with a large clay footprint, and it's got a very large uh, high-grade footprint. And within that 200 ppm footprint, there's there's those sort of grades you saw in the last slide. There's um, you know kilos, uh, three, four, five kilos. There's golds in the 20s, 20 ppm's uh, grams per ton. There's um, you know not unusual to see 10 grams gold, 40 grams gold. So we really do, we do really do have a Bonanza grade system exposed on surface, and it's really unusual that this was overlooked in the past. And um, yeah, it's um, it's been really exciting to to see that evolve. So it's all good to have a really good surface footprint, footprint and answer that initial question: how how big is it? Does it have the scalability to be something world class? I think definitively we showed that yes, it does have that potential to be world class. And, you know, I'm coming from a, a, um, a background in Newmont where I worked for the um, ounce portfolio manager of, of, the, um, of the company. And um, one lesson I learned was that grade is absolute king in economics of mineral deposits. So the, the one thing that we really wanted to answer was, does this thing have grade over that area? And like I mentioned, it does. Does it have the footprint? Yes, it does have the footprint to be world-class. So then the next question is, does it have any kind of verticality to it? Or are we just seeing a, surf a surface phenomenon or, an, or a horizon that's just by some freak reason of geology is, is there and there's nothing under it? So in late 2020, once we realized that that footprint was there, we set to task on answering that next question. 
what's the verticality of the system? Does it have a does it have a, a vertical component to it? Is there something under this footprint? Um, so we we set to doing an IP survey in in uh, late 2020, and we injected current into the ground, electricity into the ground, and when you inject electricity into into the ground, it's called an IP survey, in, induced polarization, and it shows you basically where there's metal minerals and um, what you see in front of you here is a, a, a compilation of the, that ge geophysical survey. It incorporates the electrical properties of the ground, which you're seeing in the red to uh, yellow colors. And um, what it's showing us is that there's a, there's a large amount of metal minerals in the ground in the form of sulfides. And we know on surface, on the surface footprint, that the, those grades that we showed earlier and that footprint that we saw on surface is also associated with metal, metal sulfides. So we were really um, delighted to see in, in that initial survey that yes, there is a verticality to the system. Now, uh, in my experience working in these things, in epithermals, to have a vertical window of 150 to 300 meters is really, is really good. And um, here we have a vertical window of about 750 meters. So what we think we have on our hands is something quite large um, and it's got a full, the full window of um, system window preserved. So we think that what we've got in front of us is a, a fully preserved epithermal system. That's what the work on surface is telling us. It's telling us that we're all of the kind of the, um, all the indications the anatomy of the system that's exposed on surface when we first saw it told us that yes we are in the upper parts of the system and it should have a it should have some verticality to it and the geophysics has confirmed that yes it does have verticality so um, we've just started uh, drilling that drilling this chargeability feature and we'll be open to questions on that um, when we finish but um, the windows there and um, and it looks like um, there's a lot of a lot of metal sulfides. The other thing that you see on this image is there's three layers. There's a green layer, a yellow layer, and a, and a gray layer. Um, these are mapped through resistivity, and um, um, the middle formation there is a formation called the Labra, and it's known across Peru to be a really good host for mineralization. And on top of that is the Tocopala formation, and that's the formation that the, the big giants, including Tocopala, are hosted in um, to our northwest. So it's not a it's not the same system type as what's to the northwest, and that's why it's been overlooked. It's 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 an epithermal system, and the, one of the first things we actually did was to try and age date it to find out if it was in that prolific time window of the the Paleocene. So we we sampled um, uh, a number of high grade veins across the uh, across the property, and we got work, and they all came in on the epith on the uh, Paleocene age. So we've established that we've got grade, grade is king, bonanza grade. It's got a grade footprint of 1.4 by 1.8. It has a vertical window of um, kind of 750 meters vertical. And it also has a bright time to produce a giant. Um, it's in the Paleocene time window, which, is, which produced all the big ones. I the very first Paleocene um, epithermal system found in this, in this window of time. Um, in this part of Peru, so it's really exciting. Dave, can you can you just touch on the the vein mantos for for those of our viewers who are unfamiliar with that terminology? Yeah, so um, in the in the volcanic unit, in the green unit, in in all the units actually, um, they're all basically stratigraphic. Like we have lots of stratigraphy, and in these types of deposits. Um, Stratigraphy can be a really, really strong control for focusing fluid flow and focusing vein formations. And um, what's happening at Curibay is that on surface, the veins are following stratiform contacts. They're following bedding contacts. They're following the formations and they're following the, this flat nature. So they're fed by, by vertical features. They're pointing out there, they're kind of like the branches of trees and then they're all coalescing into specific stratigraphic horizons and they're forming what we call a 
vein mantos, and they're basically flat-lying stock works controlled by stratigraphy. And all that mineralization that we're seeing on surface is kind of like, it's, it's the flat manto that we're seeing on surface. And we're seeing kind of the leaves and the, the veins that are, that are controlling that, uh, that are being controlled by that, that stratiform stratigraphy. And the goal of the, the, goal of the, of the drilling and is to understand the economics of what it is. Obviously, we want our ounces close to surface. Obviously, we want to find a big fat with the hole we're putting into the ground. Is that man really there? Um, because in geophysics, it's telling us it's just below surface between 100 to um, basically 30 meters from surface. And all the veins we're seeing on surface are kind of like the, the outer part of that vein mantle. And we're just seeing the, the diffuse veining on the outside of, of the mantle. And so that's what the, the holes were designed to, to test. And they're also designed to test the presence of the feeding structures, which are like these branches on the tree that Peter was, uh, these sort of like, yeah, that Peter's highlighting there. And um, they, they, they're, they're, that's what's delivering all these, um, these veins to surface. They're coming up in these feeder structures. So between the manto and a first order target being so close to surface, there could be a pitable target there. On the second order target, which is equally as important, is getting across these feeder zones and seeing if there's, um, you know, really high grade focused fluid flow in over widths of 10 to 20 meters um, that are in more vertical structures. And then all those things coalesce at the at the bottom of the formation change. And like I was saying with the mantos earlier, these things are these are things that are controlled by stratigraphy. And you can see on that where it says 50 millivolts. It's a flat body. That flat body sits in the formation change. And for whatever reason, geologically across deposits across the world, um, formation changes are really special places for forming mineral deposits. So all that mineralization and all those mantos near surface, as well as the feeders are all kind of coalescing at that, at that, that elevation. So um, yeah, there could be a, a, a quite a strong, um, another manto down below basically. And then um, we also flew a magnetic survey um, and we identified what we think could be an intrusion down there. And so, um, yeah, this could be, uh, we could be seeing the complete transition from the uh, epithermal environment all the way down to the magmatic environment. So basically anything's possible um, based on all that information. So it's it's a really exciting target, and um, yeah, we just put our first hole into it. Yeah, and and, uh, and to touch on the fact when you're looking at uh, an asset like this, the size and the scale, uh, when we go back to that infrastructure slide, you know, it's really important that um, there's nothing blocking us from really pushing this project forward, and uh, there's no agriculture anywhere present. There's no archaeology that uh, might 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 put the brakes on the project uh, and it's free of any kind of residence and the community is is so important uh when you're dealing with a project like this in peru especially um and uh, we've had such unbelievable support from our local community that we're working with so it, it it truly is for us to to deliver and we couldn't be more excited about it and dave maybe you could just talk really briefly about uh about this slide here yeah, this one, uh, it, it basically emphasizes what we've been saying. You can see the, the color map below the, the grade, uh, the rock chip grabs on surface, which are indicated by the purple and red squares. And they're sitting bang on top of the chargeability feature, which should be mapping uh, metal, metal sulfides. And we know that on surface they're associated with metal sulfides. So there's a really strong correlation between the grade and the occurrence of mineralization on surface and the the um, the IP uh, anomaly that's sitting below it that you just saw in cross section, but here it is on surface. So it just feels like it's um, it feels legit. It feels like um, it's a proper system. It feels like it's got the scalability. I mean, we call ourselves tier one, so we better be lining up tier one opportunities for people. And um, yeah, that the data is just showing us that. This thing looks very real to us.
yeah, it, it certainly is exciting. And for those of you that have been following us since uh, since the Oran days and have been shareholders since the Oran days, you, you've known, you've been patient uh, throughout the process. You know, a lot of things came together on, on Kuribaya at all the right time. Um, not just the the exciting data that we've received on the on the geological side of things, but corporately as well. Permitting and social and everything in Peru has really been incredible, and that that is such a testament to the team on the ground and and operations led by Christian Rios and and Dave down there to having everything uh, everything we do treated as if we are a, a premier major, and uh, that comes all the way from the top of leadership. Um, corporately to ensure that uh, we are we are handling ourselves as if. And so from receiving drill permits to receiving access to the community, uh, water rights and, and every permit possible by the government, uh, we finally have commenced drilling. Uh, we've completed our first hole. We have now sending all our cores off to the lab to get analyzed and, you know, as they say, it's the the truth teller and uh you know we can get some indications of 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 what we're seeing but really it, it all comes down to what the lab tells us uh, we've started our second drill hole last night uh very exciting to get that going and we're learning so much about the drilling um we truly are and this again has never been drilled before this is much unlike any other exploration company you've come across where they are saddling up next to something uh that has been around forever and well known or drilled multiple, multiple times before trying to replicate what they found or, or, or try to even, you know, revive a pulse off of, a, of a, an older project. This is completely virgin, completely untouched, and uh, we're the first ones down there. So we're learning a ton about the rock and the geology. And I'm sure Dave can attest to the fact that uh, what we're really pleased and what we're, um, what we're seeing is, is the mapping and, and everything that we've planned out as far as the formation changes and what we're running into, uh, it's all gone really to plan. So it's 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 very exciting. Uh, so again, you know, we're we're dealing with uh, a truly a tier one opportunity here, and the name does us justice. We 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 are on the hunt for for a major discovery, uh, not something mediocre. Uh, so just to give a brief example of our portfolio project, again, I mentioned at the introduction. We're trying to provide our shareholders with multiple world-class opportunities. You know, we sometimes get the question, if Kuribai is the end all be all, you know, why do you bother with having other, you know, projects? Well, as Ivan Bevick said it best, you know, greed does play into it, right? We want we want more. And if we can find these projects, we're not just gonna find anything to, to put in our portfolio and jam it in there. These are potential world-class assets in and of themselves. So you're gonna be hearing a lot about uh, Hurricane Silver in, in the next coming months as we progress that. Amelia and Coastal Batholith, you know, being a, a very large land package that we're getting some excellent results on. So we wanna constantly be, be providing our shareholders with opportunity, constantly pro be providing ourselves with these opportunities. And uh, it's an exciting portfolio to have, but obviously everyone that's tuning in and everyone that's paying attention to us, we have our horse blinders on the Kuribaya project and it's, and it's all systems go there. So just to give you an understanding of our capital structure, again, we are a spin out of Oren Resources. So when they ceased to be a company in October, tier one inherited 112 million shares to start off. Now, just to show you the strength of our shareholders, it, it, it truly is why we dedicate a slide to them. Uh, around 75, 80% of our financing that we completed in, in March, where we raised $13.5 million at a dollar per share Canadian, no warrants. Uh, came from former Orange shareholders. These are people that have been with the company, uh, are familiar with the leadership, the management, and our technical team. And it just shows the confidence that they have in us. And, and we really appreciate it. We really pre appreciate the patience that they had for us while we got our company listed. Uh, so we have a, an ample treasury that allows us to, to produce our 10,000 meter drilling program. We are currently traded on the PSX Venture under the symbol TSLV and also under the OTC on TSLVF. We hope to have our QB listing in the next couple of days. We're in our final kind of uh, uh, pieces of the puzzle there. So as we, we've mentioned a few times before, hole one is completed, uh, hole two underway, and, and we're gonna get this thing, we're gonna get this thing going. Uh, again, pursuing those world-class opportunities, uh, providing uh, multiple opportunities for people 
as I mentioned, if you are investing into an exploration company, one, please look at the people in the leadership. Have they done it before? Do they know how to find that discovery? Do they know how to handle the discovery? We have the leadership that's done it multiple times before. We have the technical team that knows how to produce these assets and these opportunities. We have the corporate infrastructure that knows how to understand how to run a public company. And, and, all, and then last but not least is the asset itself. And sometimes all those pieces come together because of the asset. So we have the pieces of the puzzle. Now we just need to execute. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing the, the uh, deck here and bring ourselves back. And I will head to the chat to see if we have any, uh, any questions we can answer here. If anyone has any questions, please please go in the chat, and uh, we're happy to to go. I'll, I'll scroll up here to make sure I didn't miss anything here. How many holes do you plan to drill to start? You mentioned the second hole is underway. What is the cost of drilling per hole? What are the upcoming milestones? When do you expect you'll need more cash? And when do you plan to get it? Thank you, Dennis. So uh, we are going to start with around six thousand meters of drilling. Um, the cost of drilling per hole, you know, in our first hole, it got got started getting expensive, and the main issue that we had uh, that we're that we're in the process of solving was was water. You know, it, if you have a flowing river right next to your exploration project, uh, that doesn't mean you can use and access that water. You have to use specially permitted water points, is what they call it in Peru, and sometimes that leads us to to bring in water from a far ways away. And so we have trucks going 24 seven to the site with the water. We're also learning a lot about the rock that we're drilling into. And when you hit into this rock that sometimes becomes very fractured, well, you lose a lot of the water into the fractured rock and you can't recycle it. Now, some people say that's a really good sign if the rock is fracturing as such, because it's a good indication that's where, where mineralization can occur. So uh, the cost is getting up is up there for the hole, but as we're learning, as we provide a closer water point, which we should have in the next couple of weeks, uh, it's going to bring the cost down dramatically. Uh, cash, we're, we're nothing indicated in the next uh, 10 to 12 months that we'll need more cash. I mean, obviously, if the, the early indications come out on these first few holes that uh, we have found something significant, um, of course, we'll look at trying to expedite expedite the, the drilling process, adding another drill to really get it going. and and maybe look at that point, but nothing on the horizon right now. The drill holes, uh, when can we expect results? Thank you, Len. Uh, so the process is we send results from the cores of each drill off to the labs in 150 meter approximate uh, bunches. Um, we didn't wanna wait until every hole is completed and then send a, a huge sample to the lab. We wanna get the results back as we, as we, as we can. So. Uh, the process is uh, 150 meters of core, you know, a day and a half, two days to, to prepare to send to the lab, a day and a half of transition to the lab. The labs are actually very efficient in Peru, uh, the labs that we're dealing with. So two week, three week turnaround time. Uh, so, you know, given all that for our first hole, we're expecting uh, early mid August for that for that data on that first hole. And uh, and we'll continue to, to prove out our other properties along the way. You saw recently we expanded our, our footprint at Curabaya by 50%. Uh, you will also hear in the next couple of, re couple of weeks the reason for that. Uh, we're very excited to, to know that Curabaya, we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg here. And uh, there, are, there are some significant indications that, that we're onto something big here. Uh, Byron, you mentioned the elevation. Dave, uh, do you want to speak to the elevation of the project? Yeah, the elevation is between one to three thousand meters. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's very doable. It's not something that's uh, requires oxygen to get up to. It's as Dave said, it, you know, having that uh, access and that infrastructure in place uh, is huge when you're calculating the cost of what could be if this could be a mine. Any major is going to look at, you know, the accessibility. Um, so it's it's it's, it's great. Um, David, uh, what are the challenges of the social environment, politics in Peru, as far as friendly or not? Uh, you know what? What an interesting last few months that we've been living in. As we uh, did our financing, as we 
completed our listing finally for our, for our shareholders, there was a huge topic of politics in Peru. And we followed closely. We never really lost a lot of sleep over what was happening because, you know, uh, as anyone who followed, follows politics, it's, it's tough to really get anything done. However, um, that being said, there is some social unrest uh, globally. And Peru is no exception. They've had five presidents in the last five years. Um, and uh, there's a lot of political turmoil. So if you've been following, you've, you've maybe noticed that the, this last election between uh, Keiko Fujimori and Pedro Castillo, Pedro came out strong with some very, you know, extreme commentary. Uh, of course, the media likes to pick up on disruptive, negative information and, uh, and, and really highlighted it. But as the days progressed and as it, what looks like he will be appointed president from our indication, um, he has been appointing and really signaling to the world that Peru is very much open for business. He doesn't have any intention of rewriting the constitution or, or really, uh, let's call it biting the hand that feeds him. You know, Peru, Peru's GDP, 40% of it relies on, on mining. So it's, it's, it's extremely important that, um, you know, he handles that with care and, and the biggest thing in Peru is the communities. And I can't stress that enough. It is, it has proven to be a very high barrier to entry in Peru, which is why so many exploration companies intend on entering Peru, but end up getting turned away because they don't have the, uh, expectations of time horizons, uh, correctly. They don't have the relationships on the ground. And frankly, they lose patience and, and they walk away because it's not up to, to them. They don't call the shots and money doesn't always solve all the problems. It comes down to respect of the local communities. And that's one thing that we really pride ourselves on. We, we take the time to listen. You know, if they tell us we don't want to talk about this for six months to the day, they don't want to talk about it. So we walk away from six months to the day, we're invited back and we have that discussion and it, it truly is. We had an amazing support from our local community up at our drill hole that blessed it in, a, in an unbelievable ceremony. And so we truly feel like, like we are partners with them and, and we're gonna continue because we know as this gets bigger and not just Kurubaya, but our other assets as well, as they, as they start proving out, there'll be more and more attention to them and, and become more popular. Uh, Dennis, uh, any plans of full US listing rather than OTC? Yes, of course. Uh, Dennis, that's, that's the intention of, if you've been following Oren, you knew that it was a New York stock exchange listed security. Of course, we have to, you know, progress our assets, uh, provide some drill holes, update 4311s, have a, a resource to get to that point. There are, um, uh, barriers to entry for those exchanges. So first step is OTCQB. Uh, second step, maybe upgrading to the TSX main board until we can get there. Uh, Trent. Can we anticipate any new trenching results and grab samples before the first drill assays? Uh, Trent, I hope you don't have access to my computer because yes, you can. In the next uh, short period, we will have some, some exciting results coming out, um, uh, which would be providing the reason why we expanded the footprint, footprint at, at Kurabai there. Uh, I'm gonna just scroll up to see if we have anything here. Uh, Giacomo, did the first hole confirm the structure of your structure slide? Dave, you want to you want to speak to that one? Yeah, no, we were. Um, it's a really big deal um, understanding the geophysics and having a model in uh, to go drill. And the first hole confirmed that we're spot on with our, our interpretation of the geophysics. Those formations are where we predict them to be in the geophysics. So we've got really strong structural control on um, our formations. Now the um, you know, the, the smaller detail, these are uh, 200 meter spaced uh, geophysical surveys. They're quite coarse. Um, so it gives us our framework to go explore in, um, but we're gonna have to fish for those high grade structures. We're gonna have to find them with the drill bit. There's just no other way um, in my experience historically. And the geophysics are showing us that you wanna put your drill in this spot. It's showing us that yes, the geophysical uh, responses are consistent with our geophysical modeling. And so we've got a really good handle on where we think those mantos are. And we've got a really good control on where we think those feeders are. So we're, we're drilling down them. And um, the next hole that's coming up, the first hole was to test the presence of the manto in the, in the, uh, in the Turkapala, in the formation change between the, uh, the, um, 
the labra, which is the sandstone unit, and the volcanics on top. And we were able to confirm that indeed there is a there is a silicified body down there. There is a manta down there. Um, and our next hole is going to drill the other way to try and find some feeders. So we've moved the next hole quite a ways away. And um, we're just going to test through those geophysical properties, drill through that stratigraphy and get a really good early handle on on what's controlling what. And um, hopefully on this hole, we'll be able to fish a, um, a nice feeder structure um, on the current hole that that's what it's assigned to do. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a really good start uh, in terms of our modeling and our structural understanding. And, and as we've, we've spoken to many times before, um, I know we've put it a lot of attention on our first hole and we, we sure are excited on that as well, but it's gonna take many, many holes and, and, and months and months of drilling for us to, to, to get an understanding of, of what we have here truly. Uh, so it's exciting. This is the exploration um, and this is the, the, the high anxiety, high excitement uh, time. Uh, but it's what it's what we we build for, and so it's it, it truly is awesome. Um, Giacomo, uh, will you drill also through the porphyry down to a thousand meters? Dave, you want to handle that one? Yeah, I know we've got uh, holes planned to test all those physical responses, including the the magnetic survey. So we've got a uh, we've got holes lined up that are going to go down and test for the presence of porphyries. Um, yeah, down down below that charge feature, absolutely. I mean, we wish we, we wish we had five drills on this property, to be honest, because it's just it's there's so many things to go and test, and we're we're really impatient ourselves, and and um, we just wish we could put more drills onto it. Unfortunately, we're in the Atacama Desert, and uh, keeping water up to the drill with permittings doesn't allow us to do that. But um, there's so much to test, and there's, there's so many varied responses that, um, yeah, we, and we've been really encouraged on our first hole. So, yeah, we're going to get down there and take a look if there's a porphyry down there, 100%. Uh, very cool. All right. Well, if anyone has any questions, I, I, I urge you to, to reach out to us either via the symposium. Uh, you can reach out to me directly at peter.dambicki at tier1silver.com or visit our website. Please, if you haven't already, check out our, our video on our website. Uh, check out our presentation. I'm sure you'll see a, a recording of this presentation as well. Uh, so with that, we hope that uh, you've enjoyed the presentation. We hope that you understand the magnitude of, of what we're after here and understand what it takes uh, to get there and how we got there. Uh, so we have the leadership, the technical expertise, and and the asset that itself, and it, we really do feel like it's worth for everyone to to, to own a piece piece of tier one going forward for that possibility. So with that, uh, thanks, Dave. Thank you, everyone at, at the uh, at the symposium for this opportunity, and uh, we'll be back to you shortly with some with some exciting news. So with that, thank you very much. Appreciate it.